Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. And today our guest is financial whiz Grace Vandecruz, managing director at Grace Global Capital, a consulting firm providing advice, restructuring, valuation, and capital raising services to businesses around the world. She's going to tell us what all of that means. She spent 15 years as an investment banker on Wall Street, and she serves on boards of some of the biggest U.S. companies today. And thank you so much, Grace, for being here. You know, we, Math is not boring. That's the that's the message that Grace is bringing to us today. <laughs> it is very exciting, actually. Carol, thank you so much for having me. I grew up in New York, some of New York, and and looking at you on TV and seeing you pioneering, oh. and such a wonderful oh. role model. Thank you. This is a delight to be here. Another child I babysat for, <laughs> and she's this huge success. I'll take full credit. Please do. <laughs> I will. <laughs> So we met recently uh, at a black feminist event with black feminists and Gloria Steinem, that's the way it goes, yeah. uh, uh, pulled together by Stacey Tisdale, yeah. talking about finances as well. And I was really so moved by your story that I said, I've got to interview this woman. What a, what a great life story. So let's take a look at the tape from that night when we first met Grace. I've climbed and summited Kilimanjaro. I've been to Everest Base Camp not once but twice. I've climbed several mountain ranges in Bhutan and Himalayan. And there's one thing I know about climbing a mountain. It's like reaching for a goal. You do it one step at a time. And please, challenge your limits. Don't limit your challenges. Challenge your limits. Two years ago, I was appointed as the first woman and the first African-American to sit on the board of a major financial services company here in the United States. I've contributed a lot to the innovation and thought ideas in the industry, so I knew I deserved a seat at the table. But I also knew that I had the strength to contribute it significantly to that board. And the reason I knew I had the strength to do so is because I earned my undergraduate degree here in New York City uh, while I was uh, going back and forth to a homeless shelter. We were poor and we were surviving. We had more love than we had food in our house. And everything was going fine until our small apartment went up in flames. And I'm here to tell every single young person, if I can survive a shelter in New York City to be sitting on this stage, there's nothing you can't do. That was just such a powerful, powerful moment. Uh, you know, the, the, the bravery that it takes. There are many people who may have lived in shelters short or long term who wouldn't mention it and wouldn't want it mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, but there were girls, lots of girls in that audience who were so moved by what you had had to say. I think my story is worth sharing. There are so many young people, particularly African Americans, that need to be encouraged and they need to understand that the journey could be very difficult and most, more than likely, it's going to be difficult. But they also need role models to share her insights and, of how we've overcome and give them hope that they can do the same as well. So your family is originally from Guyana? Yes. And when this shelter situation happened, there, was, how, there were how many? You were, you're one of seven. Right? I am one of seven. So we're a family of nine. I was born in Guyana, South America. We immigrated to the United States when I was 14, settled in Brooklyn, and eventually my mom was able to uh, get housing for us because you can imagine renting a housing with, house would, an apartment would be very difficult. And a lot of the, the advice that she got was not to tell a landlord she had seven children. And she would go and they would be ready to give her the keys and, and they'd say, how many? children and she, she would always say seven 
And eventually a landlord that had said no uh, reached out to her and actually called her back and said, aren't you the lady who came with and said you had seven children? And she said, yes. And, she, and he said, you can, have, you can have the place. Wow. So we were, rent, so we were renting. The so when did the fire happen? You were yes. a little bit older then. Yes, the fire occurred when I was uh, going to Pace University uh, here in New York City, commuting back and forth to Brooklyn. And in June, I remember, because I was taking some summer classes, I came home and uh, just the entire brownstone that we lived in was just engulfed in, in smoke and flames. The fire uh, department was at the tail end of putting the fire out. And my mom was sitting calmly, I remember, uh, uh, with my siblings. And I said, what happened, of course, in the shock, I said, and she said, well, we had fire. And that your mom sounds like a very calm person. I guess if she managed to raise seven beautiful, well-behaved children, <laughs> <laughs> she was a calm mother, a calm person. But then finding another place was impossible. Yes, very difficult. We had s social workers came, uh, the Salvation Army came, and our, our relatives came, and everyone uh, gave us a solution that, that included separating the family. And my dad, who was an orphan when he was seven years old, always said the most painful memory of his life was when he was separated from his two brothers. And that evening he said, there's no way we're gonna separate as a, as a family. And the only solution for us was to go to a homeless shelter and be together. And so you were together, and uh, this was for about a year that you lived like, like this. You still went to school, your siblings still went to school? Yes. You know, and so you graduated, and, and, and then what happened? I mean, this is a, it's such a fabulous story. Every step of the way, you know, <laughs> there's some incredible thing in Grace's life. Yes. So when we, had, when we were in the shelter, it was a very difficult time for me. And I remember going into school and I, had, I was scheduled to take 12 credits that fall. I increased it to the maximum number I could take. Which was, was 18, 18 credits. 18 credits. That's a heavy, yes. heavy load. So I studied mainly in the library and it really uh, enhanced my desire to uh, study, focus on my education and succeed. Right. Well, you're, you're different because for many people, that's the thing that kills that desire. You know, it's just too un unsettling. It's too much. It's, it's too grim in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to take, I want to drop out of school, not increase my credits to 18. Why, where do you think that sure. strength came from? I think the strength came from my background, the fact that I had the support and love. Uh, I, I grew up in a very loving family. Both my parents really focused on the family. My mother had always been the CEO of her, our household. And uh, when we came to United States, she went back to school to pursue her, her degree. She wanted, that was nursing for her. Prior to that, she was a housewife. And so she set an example of mobility and pursuing your dreams and vision for us. And so we always view that shelter as a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. And because we had uh, such parents and we had such outlook of opportunity and possibilities, uh, we knew that it was just temporary. So uh, after Pace, you went to Pace, graduated from Pace, and then suddenly you're at the Wharton School of Business, one of the best schools in the world. Yes. Uh, tell us how that happened. And how did you pay for that? Oh, yes. Okay, that's a good question. This is all leading <laughs> up to her becoming one of the big financial, you know, whizzes of the world, but go ahead. After PACE, I uh, obtained my CPA license and I worked at e &Y, which is one of the major accounting firms, and I did auditing. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for laughing. Sorry. You're talking to one of those people who, I think I had to go to summer school twice for geometry, you know, so it all fits there in that same category. But you loved accounting. 
I love accounting. You love really the numbers. Do. You and love I, the math. And it's just not all math. It's also relating to clients and meeting people and getting a chance to, to learn about different businesses and how they operate. It gives you a great perspective on a company. And after six years, I decided to pursue my a degree in finance. And I applied to all the top schools. Wharton uh, was one of those that accepted me. And it turned out to be one of the, the best two years of my life. I truly enjoyed that environment. So uh, you got your MBA from Wharton, mm -hmm. and this sets you on. I, you and I were discussing before some of the quotes that I've come across about women at, in business and, and how it is that they seem to shy away from the math, mm -hmm. uh, from the MBA. And uh, someone was writing about, you know, they actually are better suited, women are, are better suited for HR because they're more em empathetic and kind and whatever. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that is that it, seldom is in the chain to the top of a company. Yes. So it, you know, it has a definite glass, a glass ceiling. So, but you, here you are, a numbers person. You had this great time at Wharton. And then after, after that? After that, I went to work on Wall Street. I worked at Merrill Lynch in their financial institutions group. And from there, I worked at a private equity firm investing in companies and and um, issuing uh, stocks on and, and the stock exchange to take those companies public. And uh, I also went back to work on the advisory side, advising insurance companies on their de demutualization, which means they were going from a private company to being traded on the stock exchange. So, so, and just having a ball, this is, yes. this is, this is great. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, of your specialties is mergers and acquisitions or M&A, yes. the short, the shorthand for it. One, uh, I mean, most people, ordinary people, when they think of that, for instance, there was the recent case of Amazon buying Whole Foods, you know, this sort of, that's a merger and acquisition, right? We're defining it correctly. I mean, people are afraid of that in a way. I mean, the language of too big to fail, you know, comes, comes around and you think, these companies are just getting too big. I mean, is working on, on them and from that side, is that a problem, a worry? I think it's an opportunity. Look, the landscape of our country is changing. As companies look to grow, they're looking to acquire companies that are consistent with their vision of growth. And Amazon is, uh, has transformed the way we shop in every aspect of our lives. Yes, I do know that they now, after they closed all the bookstores in the country, they have opened, they have, there are two bookstore, Amazon bookstores open in, in Manhattan now, so. Yes, because That's, there's still value. In there's us. still value in there's, bricks and mortar, in what? Bricks, yes, there is, <laughs> there is. But only if you've cleared the field, right? You know, that, that you can come back and open the, uh, open the bookstores. But you're, so you're advising companies like Amazon and really huge. Right, and my focus are on the financial services companies. Right. And uh, we have a very fragmented market, meaning there are many companies that are, are fighting for market share. Yet uh, the cost of regulation and the investment in technologies are needed, so companies are looking to, for acquisitions. In addition, in an acquisition, a company can acquire uh, talent that the uh, acquired firm has. So we work with these companies to see what fits in their strategic goals. And you, with that smile, you say, yes, you know, go right ahead. Big, bigger, there is no such thing. Is there such a thing as too big? There, there is a concept of being too big to fail, particularly when we merged out of the financial crisis. And the term came out of the fact that some companies are so interconnected that if they failed, it would have a triggering effect right. on the entire everything. economy. So yes, there is that concept. It is a real concept. And I think that's why some uh, industries are regulated to make sure that there are enough bells and whistles and regulations in place uh, for that company to follow. 
So uh, one of the uh, segments that you advise are the insurance companies. You know, so I should ask you, what do you think about health care reform? And how are the insurance companies taking, uh, taking all of this? It's still too early to know. We don't really have. It is too early to know. We live in an environment of, of lots of uncertainty. And it's too early to tell whether health care will, reform will be passed and what parts of the ACA Obamacare will be kept intact. Uh, so it's, it's a time when we are really, it's a wait and, we're taking a wait and it's see wait approach. And see. But now Bernie Sanders has a plan. He's yes. a single payer. I mean, and many people don't know, I had to go look it up to exactly what does that mean. And, and what it means is that instead of insurance companies, the government will pay for your, for your medical costs. I don't think you like that. Well, wait a minute. There are a number of <laughs> industrial countries have it. Yes. Uh, 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 businessmen like uh, Warren Buffett, uh, you know, right? have publicly said that this is the way we need to start to go. And he owns and, Progressive. He owns many insurance companies. Yes. But, right? Yes, right. and he owns many insurance companies. And I do think it's going to uh, grow in, in popularity of let's look at that because the system needs a lot of fixes. And we have, we have an aging population, right. uh, healthcare costs are rising, uh, more of the burden is being shifted from the employer to the employee. So this is an issue on everyone's minds. So uh, talk to me about this mountain climbing because you say that it's the, it's a, it's the kind of thing that helps you understand your challenges in life. And you went on your first climb at Wharton, you were invited by a professor who started this long, you know, lifelong love of, of mountain climbing, Mount Everest and, and what else? Where else have you been? Yes, so my very first climb, which wasn't at Wharton, was slightly after I graduated. My professor, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Yusim, invited a group of alums to come back and together to climb. His vision was that we would climb during the day and have a bonfire discussion at night at, on a relevant business issue. And our first trip was to Bhutan. So mm -hmm. 28 of us met in Bhutan. It's interesting to know that I did not know anyone and I had not climbed before. <laughs> <laughs> this was your first climb. It was my first climb. So right. why, why did I do it? So uh, I had... Uh, just emerged from 9-11. 9-11 was still fresh in my mind and like many people I had resolved to start taking more meaningful vacations. I knew it would meant it meant going out of my comfort zone, didn't know what that meant at the, the time, but when I got this invitation it was so timely of something I needed to explore. So Bhutan, the goal was to climb 20,000 feet in altitude for 14 days. And we climbed um, oh, on the eighth day when we got to 17,500 feet, which was only 2,500 feet uh, shy of our goal. One of our team members got very ill. He was medically evacuated, but he eventually died. Huh. And as a group, we decided uh, to come back to, uh, to uh, uh, to United States and really um, be with his family to mourn his death. Sure, sure. But in that grief, a small group of us came together and said, perhaps the way we honor uh, our deceased teammate is to continue this journey and to continue climbing uh, in a much more unified way. And so now you've, you've continued to do that for, for all these years. years. So 13 years later, yes, we have uh, summited, I'd say around 25 various peaks on three different continents. Uh, we've been to Everest Base Camp twice, uh, one bef once before the, the hurricane and then second after the hurricane to support the many Sherpas and porters that had assisted us. And then next year, I'm climbing to uh, Elbrus, which is the highest peak in Europe. So the climb continues. The climb continues. <laughs> Good. So for, for people who are, are saying, look at, look at this success, what, so the mountain climbing, you know, symbolic, 
of that kind of perseverance, certainly finishing school, taking more credits, going to grad school. But there's so many girls and young women who are afraid of what you've done, you know, of the, what seems to be the hard stuff. What, what do you say to them? I say just it, view it as a mountain, view it as a climb. And what's most important is to take one step at a time. Uh, when I was climbing Kilimanjaro, uh, the Sherpas would remind us the words poli poli, which in Swahili means slowly, slowly. The deeper meaning is measure every step you take and, and step in a way that you are going forward, move forward in spite of the difficulty, look carefully and step wisely. And it's amazing to me, even as I climb the mountain and in my life, that when I go forth one step at a time, even though it might be ever so slowly, that as I look back over the arc of my life and the arc of my career, how much significant uh, progress I've made. But I really do think we have to encourage our girls to go forward boldly and take a step, that there is more strength within them than they realize, and more support that we are here to mentor them, we're here to be examples, and we're here to give hope. And what's the, uh, the, the at top most, the cautionary tale you would tell them? Because just as climbing the mountain had an unfortunate uh, result, I mean, mm -hmm. so it's not all positive. You know, if you go out, if you go up a mountain, there is the chance that you won't come back down. So what cautionary tales do you say Yes. Give to young girls. The cautionary tale that I would say is remember, uh, remember your faith. Remember uh, your goals and values and remember why you're striving, your, the whys in your life. It's very important to me to, to know that although there might be naysayers, and they always will, that if you set your mind on a goal, even if you, there are several twists and turns, and there will be, as you, you're learning your path, to keep on going, yeah, to I'm, keep on pursuing it. Right. I, I I'm, uh, also take note of the fact that your family was, is, is from Guyana. You came yes. here as an, as an immigrant. And there uh, have been several scares about, uh, related to DACA and whether or not young people will be able to stay in this country and you know you said to me earlier I'm an immigrant and I'm living the American dream uh, what was your reaction when you heard uh, when you first read the tweet or heard that that so many 800,000 or more young people were in danger I don't think that the American public see enough examples of success amongst the immigrant community and how many of our businesses here are built on mm -hmm. the uh, backs of the immigrants. Uh, and I think we need to showcase that more. Uh, the immigrant brings, and I can tell you from my own pers personal experience, the immigrants brings a, a sense of opportunities and possibilities and are willing to work hard and sometimes much harder than uh, uh, Americans born here that take opportunities for yeah, granted. That causes, that's just right at the crux of the controversy of it, you know, that there are some who, who say that immigrants work harder and get the jobs uh, easier uh, and get high, paid more than Americans, you know, part of the whole make America great again concept. So, but, but you feel this to be true. Is it, does it, that come out of a sense of gratitude for being in this country? Or, or, or what do you think that comes from? I think it can, comes from an enormous amount of gratitude of uh, being in this country. And uh, sometimes when we talk about the immigrants uh, and what's being uh, done in this country, it's as if it's a zero sum game. If the immigrants mm -hmm. are progressing, that means Americans are hurting. But there's so many examples 
of the rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. And s so many opportunities uh, where both Americans and immigrants can succeed. Uh, and I so, think, you know, I think we're, we're facing a very interesting time where we're, we're going towards a much more technological world requiring mm -hmm. different skills. And I think the, the, the way we can succeed as a country moves beyond the immigrants into how can we retrain our workers and how can we make opportunities available for everyone. Yeah, as we come to the close of every uh, show, I ask my guest uh, to finish the statement, the power, the strength of black America lies in. How would you finish that? The power and the strength of black America lies in our financial wealth and potential. Much of it at times are untapped, but I do think our strength lies more within our community than without. And to the extent that we continue our focus on education, that we reinforce the strong values that made us as a people so resilient, we will succeed. So when you say financial, you're, you're talking about taking it to another level. Yes. Yes, too many times financials, financial can be so intimidating. Uh, but I think there's so many opportunities I'm pleased to work with Winning Plays and to continue the discussion. Winning Plays is Stacy Tisdale, is the, where we met, yes. right? And you guys are going six to six cities. We're going to six cities, and our purpose is to increase financial literacy uh, and really talk about not only getting on firm financial footing, but investing in the stock market. Okay and ensuring right. and, our lives. Yeah, and I'm just gonna share a secret. The stocks are gonna be great, you know, so that, yeah, Grace told me that before the show started. So invest. Yes. Thank you so much, Grace well. Vandecruz, for being with us. And thanks to you all out there too. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and we'll see you the next time.